Welcome, world. What's going on, man? I want to welcome everybody to the first episode of Southside Talk with your boy, Big Creed. And your girl, Loquita. And we got a very special guest in the building, Mexican-American movie star, Mr. Dan De La Paz. How you doing? Very well, thank you. Very well. And I appreciate you coming through, man, being our first guest. You know, you That's just cool. pop the cherry, you know what premier, I'm saying? Premier issue. Premier issue. There it is, man. So what do you think about the vibe of the Southside spot here, man? I like it. I like it right here. Like I was saying earlier, I came here to buy my wood for the fireplace, so right. I'm familiar with the area. So when I first came here, I was kind of surprised. Like, wow, I already know this place, but I didn't realize there was anything here. Right, right, because off the avenue next door, shout out to River City Steel. Yeah. Um, they sell all the wood and, like, uh, you know, construction stuff. It's a Hustlers uh, Avenue. Well yeah, it's cool because it's a freeway close, so mm -hmm. people can get here pretty easily with the access to the freeway and all that. But it's great. I love how you guys are combining the businesses too. Right, right. Yeah, we got a lot of sponsors too, man. Shout out to our sponsors, man. Southern Image, Beautiful Monsters, the AC Doctors, Paranoid Records, Pack a Low Low Plug, 210 Texas Nation, the Big Homies Network, DJ Lucky, Static TV, the Mr. Pot Podcast, Dirty Berry Music, Dirty Berry Soda. Culture Collective, Alex Airbrush, Stay High, Wake and Bake, Bear County Cuts, and Dirty Money Records, man. We in here, still banging music, all that. Hey. You know what I'm saying? So, let's get into it. When did you get your first start at acting? Uh, when I was 14, a uh, freshman in high school. Okay. Started uh, doing, in the theater department doing plays. Okay, and, and where are you from originally? Where are you from? From LA. From Los, Los Angeles. Angeles yeah. City of Woodier. Okay. Okay. There's a there's actually a city called Whittier as well as a boulevard. The boulevard runs through like maybe five or six different cities. That used to be like y'all's military. Everybody used to cruise on yeah. Whittier. Yeah. Oh Whittier. Okay, so Whittier was the boulevard. Yeah, yeah. Whittier is a big, long boulevard that drives you all you know for miles through like six different cities. All the way it ends in downtown. Isn't that where they had a scene from Boulevard Nights? Uh, right? They, they shot the cruising on the right. boulevard. Whittier yeah. Boulevard in East LA. Yeah. I live further down the boulevard when you pass East LA, you pass Montebello, past Pico Rivera, and then the yeah. city, what are you? So that's what I grew up. So yeah, it all started in doing uh, plays and, and theater. I got the bug. I just, I liked it, you know? You, know so, you do something that you like, and then right away you think, okay, maybe this is where I fit in, you know? Right, right. right. So did you start your acting career like middle school, high school? Um, like around what age did you realize that this was what you you're going to be doing for life. You know? I had my first professional job before I graduated in my senior year. Okay. So I had to uh, not drop out of school, but I had to go to night school to get the number of credits I needed to graduate because in the spring in April, a couple months before graduation, I started rehearsing this job that I got. So um, I was not getting paid. So I went to work in the day and then went to night school at night and ended up graduating, but that's how I did it. Nice, nice, nice. So we're going to move things forward, okay? So your most popular movies are Boulevard Nights and American Me. I would say, yeah, I did about 35 films, but people tend to like them. Like those, <laughs> the ones that stand out, right? Is there any other ones you want to throw out there that they're sleeping on that, that, that you feel like, you know, like... That, well, you know, when, when, it all, when I started, there wasn't any internet, you know, there right. was no personal computers, no cell phones. So it was, when you did a movie, it came out of movie theaters and people went to go see it. And then um, right after Boulevard Nights came out of theaters, you know, movies would just disappear, right? But then they invented cable television, which happened right around the same time that Boulevard Nights came out. So Boulevard Nights was actually one of the first films first. in that genre. Uh, yeah, in that first graduating class of movies yeah. that got shown on cable. Right, that right. Was right. Nice. And of course, you know, the Raza, right? They just taped it off the cable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. 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 Yeah. Right. There it goes to the swap meets. We go to. But, man, that's what made that movie so popular because it yeah. took about um, nine years before they actually released the official VHS. Right, right. And by that time, there was video stores and Blockbuster and all that stuff. Then you had your old school piracy back then. They weren't bootlegging DVDs and stuff like yeah, this era of fire states. They were bootlegging VHS, yeah. VHS. But the, the people that taped it off the off the, the old cable stations, some of which aren't even around anymore, uh, they're the ones that started passing it around. And so, I think that's how the new generation afterwards, the younger ones came up. That's how they saw it for the right. first time. So do you think that back then, um, when when Boulevard Nights came out? that it made it a little harder for it to come out because you were Vasa? 
Because no, was, Boulevard Nights was a Warner Brothers movie. Yeah. So it had the full support of the Warner Brothers studio. Right. So it was in theaters all over the country. It was billboards everywhere, on the buses, television commercials, radio commercials. It was just saturated yeah. with advertising. So no, it was very well known when it came out. It wasn't like some little movie that didn't have a yeah. budget for advertising. It was full on Warner Brothers you know, A-plus treatment. Yeah, because especially, well, because I grew up in South Central and Hawaii, but I know when that movie came out, I was little, little. So once I got older, I it was like still a big thing in LA, like, because I think it was just Boulevard Nights and Colors. Mm. Those were the two movies that were like, that really shined on the lifestyle of the, the gang life in LA. Right. Yeah. So, and it was... Is a real thing out there. You and know? Colors was many years after, like yeah. six or seven years after, mm -hmm. maybe eight years after. So what year did uh, Boulevard Nights officially get released? It got released in the spring of 1979. Wow. And it's going to have its 43rd anniversary next month. Wow. Congratulations, man. Yeah, and American Me's turning 30. Okay. okay. And I don't want to tell you what I'm turning. <laughs> all right, all right. 21. 21. So what, what would you say was your first big movie role that you landed because like you said, you participated in 30 plus films, I believe? Yeah. Okay, what, what was the one that, like I said, you feel like people might have slept on a little bit or you feel like, man, I like that character, you know? That oh, was the one that I, I thought was gonna... I did this Western with Willie Nelson. Oh, Ooh, shit. And it's a beautiful film called Barbarossa. And we shot it here in Texas. And um, people that are into Westerns, okay, they they really like that movie. You know, all the movies I made, <laughs> became cult movies. <laughs> right. I, I can never figure that out, but they all have their little niches, you know? Yeah. People that like the 80s movie like 315 and Miracle Mile, and people that like the westerns like Barbarossa, and people that like the political thrillers like Cuba with Sean Connery, God bless him, rest in peace. Yeah. Um, so, you know, a lot of these movies that I made ended up becoming very popular amongst the people that like that particular kind of movie. Right, right. I mean, I never made a rom-com or something like that, but, you know, I did make a few different kinds of films other than just gangster films. But, right, right. So I think that was one that I, I like a lot because it's beautifully shot. Kind of like a Bonanza, old school vibe? Yeah, it takes place in the 1860s or whatever, and, but I come from a wealthy Mexican family, so they have money and everything. You know, it wasn't like we're poor Mexicans. Yeah. Or whatever, but, um, it was a really beautiful script written by a guy from Texas who wrote a television series called Lone Star. That was very popular. Oh, I used to watch that. Did you? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Lone Star was very yeah. popular back in the day. Um, and Willie Nelson and Gary Busey and myself, you know. And Gary Busey? Yeah, Gary Busey. Yeah, that's yes. legendary guys, man. Right? And he had just done Buddy Holly a couple of years prior to that, so I was excited. So is it true what they say about Willie Nelson, man? He be chief and big? Oh, Willie's a great guy. Willie just loves to live life. Go live life and just enjoy everything. He doesn't judge anybody. He's right. completely down to earth. And that, I just finished reading a biography about him. Oh, man, there's so much I didn't even know. I was just blown away by that man's life. But uh, mad respect, Willie, if you're listening. Mad respect. Hey, mad respect, man. Love that guy. Hell yeah. yeah, we need to get Willie Nelson at the Southside spot. <laughs> really Willie guy. Nelson, man, tap in with us. Yeah, you know if, he, I mean? if he was available, he'd probably do it. <laughs> That's love, man. So let's fast forward things a little bit, man. So how did you land the role for American Me? Well, let me see. It. Boulevard Nights was 79, and American Me was 13 years later. Okay. So... Okay, picture this. We're on the set of Boulevard Nights. Me and the guy that plays my brother and the girl that plays Shady. And we're on the boulevard inside the 72 Monte Carlo. And we're waiting for them to set, reset the lights. So we're just sitting in the car mm -hmm. with all the other cars. Yeah. And we're just, you know, chopping it up. And we're talking about future projects that we've heard about that have roles for Latinos or Chicanos, right? right. And... Um, one of these projects that's been around for a while, since the early 70s, was called American Me. And everybody knew about it. It was a script that was floating around, but it hadn't been made yet, right? Yeah. So this is 1978, the summer of 78. We're talking about American Me. And I was saying, oh, man, I'd love to do that film. At that time, if they had made it around that time, I would have probably played Little Puppet. The younger brother, because I was yeah. much younger. <laughs> well, so the 70s are gone now, and they didn't make the movie. The 80s came and went, yeah. 
they still didn't make the movie. The early 90s, I'm at a party, and Edward James almost is there, and he's like, hey, get ready. We're going to make American Me. Man, I almost choked on my chicken wing. <laughs> American Me? What are you, the hell are you talking about? I forgot all about it. It's been yeah. so long. He goes, yeah, I finally got it together. All these years, they've been trying. But he needed to become a star, which Miami Vice helped him do on television. Yeah. And get him into a certain position to where he had the mojo to convince Universal Studios to give him a big chunk of change right, to right. make that movie. Because he knew it was going to cost, oh, you yeah. know, some money. Back and then things cost a little major, more than they do now. Major. Well, but back then, you, the you, film wise, films didn't cost as much as they cost to make now. Yeah. Right, right. But um, it still was for that time a nice little chunk of change. But that's what happened. Thirteen years later, he ended up making American Me. And the way he cast it was, he just would gut because he knew everybody. He knew all the actors already that were working at that time. Right. And he would just have us come over to this warehouse and. We would sit around a table, and there was a scripts, and he would say, okay, you read this, and you read that part, and you read this part. So we'd read it for 10, 15 pages. Okay, now you switch, and you read that part, and you read this. So it, was like, it wasn't like an audition. It was like very relaxed, and everybody was just sitting around, just reading and trying different stuff out. But I remember I read the part of Puppet, right? And then he made somebody else read it. <laughs> I remember thinking... Damn, I like that part. Right? That's what I want. <laughs> I want to play that part. Well, you know, there's so many damn parts in that movie. Yeah. It's a long movie. And then you got all these characters, right? So, in my mind, I'm thinking, who the hell is ever going to remember anybody except for J.D., Santana, and Mundo? Yeah. The three main guys. Who's going to remember all these people? But there was that one character who does that one thing mm -hmm. that is so, you know, outrageous. I mean... I thought, well, if you could do that well, even though you're not the star of the movie, you know, people will remember you yeah, because yeah. that's something that you don't see too world, often. Right? You know? called it was done in The Godfather. Pacino kills his own brother right. in the Godfather, but he doesn't yeah. actually do it himself. Oh, okay, okay. But when I read the script, I, I remember thinking to myself, it reminded yeah, me. Yeah, The Godfather. Right. And I like that actor, John Cazale, very oh, yeah. much. I, I relate to him. He's Him and I are very much alike, with a high forehead. And, <laughs> you know, um, just our style of acting was very similar, so I almost felt like that was kind of a cosmic connection that we had, that we played these two brothers who, you know, were stuck in a situation yeah. of having to do something that normally brothers wouldn't do to each other. Right, right. So yeah, it was 13 years between, and but that's how it all happened. Edward James almost just hand-picked everybody. He pretty much knew everybody, who everybody was already and said, well, okay. It's, he's the director and the producer and the co-writer. It's his baby, so right. he picked and chose who he wanted to be in it. And he saw a lot of new people, too. He, he gave a lot of new people a, a start also. But i got to say something about Edward James almost. He hired everybody on the crew. Makeup, hair, wardrobe, um, gaffers, grips, camera assistants. Everybody was Latino or Chicano. Nice. He had a big piece of pie. He makes sure every got, everybody got a piece That's of that pie. Now, a lot of people don't realize that about him, but I'd like to put it out there that right, right. You know, we didn't have a chance to get a lot of big-budgeted Latino films made, and that was one of the biggest at the time. And yeah. He made sure everybody got a nice chunk of change. Everybody was very well paid in that movie. Nice. That's good Thanks to him. Know. Thank you. Edward James almost Shout out to Edward you. James almost. And your work on the Mayans, more success to you. Oh, I love that one. that show. Yeah. It's doing very well. Oh, yeah. Show. It's and it's funny because um, Richard Cabral, mm -hmm. he started off as a Chicano rapper, which was one baby job. I used to sign autographs at the Santa Fe Spring Swap Meet. Yeah. Okay. And the guy that whose booth I was in, it wasn't my booth, right? Uh -huh. He had his own record company. Urban Kings. Oh, yeah. Okay, and Baby Jokes was on the label. Right. So he would come in, you know, I could tell he was full on 100% gangster. Yeah. Not only a gangster, real, real gangster. Real gangster, yeah. real life. I mean, his life makes Boulevard Nights look like Mary Poppins, yeah. you know. But um, yeah, he would come in and he would have talent. Yeah. I would listen to all these guys, you know, him and uh, Charlie Rowe Campo, that whole. Yeah. Well, Midget Loco, that's who I'm signing. Midget There's Loco, still yeah. And Miss Crazy, yeah, and he had a lot of good people on that label, mm -hmm. but he would come in all the time. He would never say too much, you know. I always felt kind of like um, nervous. 
No, <laughs> well, a little bit. It's he so kind of made me feel a little bit like, you know, I'm the real deal, and you're just, you're just the uh, <laughs> facts only, you know? Right. Yeah. So I got, always got that vibe from him, but uh, he's a real great guy. We ended up making a gangster film together, him and I, okay. before he really broke out, Yeah. called Kill Capone. Oh, okay. And uh, he's very good in it. He really is. He's excellent in it. Yeah. And um, it was it was a good experience getting to work with him. And I remember he um, on the set. He, his mother came and visited, and he asked me if I would come and meet his mom because she was a big fan and everything. You know? Oh, that's awesome. That was kind of <laughs> sweet. But yeah, really talented guy. I went and saw his one man show where he in the theater. It's like a small theater like this, mm -hmm. where it's just him, maybe an audience of a hundred people, and man, you could hear a pin drop. Is it like improv or? No, nope, it was him, a one man show, one giant monologue of wow. him growing up Ooh. and his gangster life. I mean, it was, it shocked even me. I thought, yeah. wow, I thought I'd heard it all. Yeah, he has an awesome story. He, the audience was eating out of the palm of his hand, man. We were just in tears. It was so beautiful. And the way he dramatized it and the way they lit it, it was really amazing. Amazing show. I hope I hope he does it again and more people can come and see it because it was an eye opener. Yeah, he's, he's a good artist. Is there so? Is there any role that you've played like a certain character in a movie that really hit your heart some kind of way that made you feel like they kind of choked you up or? Well, it's funny you should say that because that part that film that we did, Kill Capone, um, I play a bit that Anna in a wheelchair. He mm -hmm. lost his his ability to walk, not from gang banging. But, yeah. um, you know, the things that that character got to say in the film were, to me, things that had not been said yet yeah. in a film about gang banging. And so I was very happy to get the opportunity to say it. But ironically enough, the way he dies is, you know, they take him out by strangling him. Yeah. So I thought, well, that's, the circle is complete now. I took my brother out and now I got taken out the same way. Yeah. So all together, you know, I did American Me and Boulevard Nights and Kill Capone and Road Dogs, which is another good yeah, urban good. film I like a lot. But my role was completely comical. It was, I was almost like I was in another movie, actually, you know. My acting style compared to everybody else in that film just stuck out like a sore thumb. <laughs> you know, you, it's a pretty serious movie until you see this character that I play whose um, elevator doesn't go to the top floor, shall we say. <laughs> Right. But you know, you grow up, even me growing up not in the hood, but the way I grew up, yeah. we had this guy that was, you know, lived, he went to school with me, and, you know, he had some mental challenges. And, um, you know, you get older, you graduate, you start driving, and, but he would always be on his bike. And he was already well into his 30s, living with his grandmother, you know, kind of a thing. And maybe he didn't even have a room, they just pulled the curtain to divide his space up or whatever. But, you know, there's always those kind of characters where you're not quite sure what is going on, but you know something's not yeah. completely right. right. And every hood is filled with them, and that character was one of those characters. So I did feel a loving feeling towards him, you know. He meant well, but he just wasn't in the same place, that, right. on the same page everybody else was on. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I get a lot of um, people that tell me how much they like that particular character. He was kind of outrageous. He's always trying to sell something. <laughs> Sounds like me. Always trying to sell something. Yeah, us is a hustle, man. stole, you know. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Something he stole. Okay, since we, we're going to move on to, to uh, selling stuff, we notice here you have a, a wide variety of merchandise. Could you uh, explain what you got going well, on? Well, let's start off by explaining that, you know, the, the, when this all started, because some people look at this and go, wow, what's with that guy and all that stuff he's got? You know, I got invited to Japan. Okay, this is like 1997 or something like that, 96, 97. And um, I thought, Japan, okay, I've got fans in Japan, right? This kind of blew my mind. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, let me just go and see what this is all about. But they said, if you're going to come to Japan, you need to bring some merchandise. Yeah. Okay, so I didn't have merchandise, and I didn't know what exactly does that mean, you know? Yeah. They said, well, can you make a sweatshirt or a t-shirt or a poster or a couple of things and bring them with you? So I made a sweatshirt, which was hilarious. It was a black sweatshirt. And all it had was about maybe a four inch little thing that said Boulevard Nights. That's it. There was nothing else other but a black sweatshirt. And I made a poster. 
It was just a collage of different scenes from Boulevard Nights because they were really into Boulevard Nights. Yeah. They love the Chicano scene. And I went to Japan. Mm -hmm. And I, they had a car show, right? So I went to the car show. It was beautifully organized. It was amazing. But I remember my first time, right? I got the table and put a cloth on it. I put my little things on there. And then I sat there, right? I'm looking out and seeing all these Japanese people. And I'm, I'm like, okay, so what do you do? What happens now, you know? I didn't know the process, right? Do I just sit here or do I get up or, you know, what do I do? And the guy goes, oh, no, just sit. And then they'll come to you and, you know, I'll translate for you and you can take pictures and, you know, say stuff. And, oh, I had a VHS of uh, Boulevard Nights, too. Uh, <laughs> really? those. You won't believe it. Yeah, the hard copies. They sold for a hundred dollars. Wow. For one VHS. Over there saying, or over everywhere? There, over, over there. Over now there. they sell for that here, but back then they sold for that over there. That was retail. Did they have video stores over there? Oh like? yeah, they had the whole nine yards. And the car show was great, but that was my first, you know, cherry popping merchandising right, experience. Right, right. <laughs> and then I came back and thought to myself, well, if I could do it in Japan, I could probably do it in the U.S. If there's a market for there's it, market. let me just dip my toe in the water and see. So I went to the Santa Fe Spring Swap Meet, mm. and my friend didn't have a booth then. We just set up a table. Yeah. He had his CDs, and since it was urban and rap music, it was kind of tied in with what I did right. too. Same demographic, right? Mm -hmm. So I would sit next to him, and he started doing really well and well. And the next thing you know, he got himself a full-on inside booth where he could just close it yeah. at the end right. of the day. Yeah, lock it up. So that I ended up being there off and on for 10 years at that place. And started to do car shows and events and, you know, uh, Sink of the Mile things right, and right. different festivals and stuff. So that's how it all started. What happened after that was that the people who would come up to the table, they would ask you, do you have this or do you have that? Or You would get a sense of that they wanted certain right. kinds of things. They wanted t-shirts or, you know, um, posters or whatever. So that's how it started. I started to create things and, um, you know, try to figure out how this would work. Because I was already a collector myself. I was a huge movie fan. And I already had a collection of things in my own personal collection. So I just took my mentality of being a collector and put it onto the people who are collecting. Because like, I'm that way too, right? right? Of what they would like. And the one thing that I promised myself was everything that I made, I was going to make high quality. I was going to make it really nice. Because um, I, I didn't like to spend money on stuff that I thought was cheap. or They were charging a lot of money for it, but they weren't giving me the value for right. my money you know so but that's pretty much how it started yeah and that's a part of the grind and one thing you know do respect a lot about you you know the movies and everything acting my whole thing you know with the store and the movement merch gang music my thing is the grind man i see you do whatever it takes car shows swap me like to this day you're out there in the field getting it you know i always I mean? like to be where the people were Right. That was my thing. Because I used to have a lot of people judge me for that. They say, what are you doing at the swap? Yeah, you know, I know. You know, I know. <laughs> people told me that my whole rap career. Yeah, yeah. It was so ghetto. Yeah, right. I always use that word and I was like, why do you judge? You know what I meant at the swap? I met attorneys. Yeah. I met doctors. I met all kinds of professional people. People from and, all and over the world. Years, everybody goes to the swap. Everybody. So you, you know, hear that, rappers? They're fresh out of heart. Start at the swap they're fresh, they're fresh out of jail and they're fresh out of you know um um you know universities they're fresh into town the visitors professionals i mean all kinds of people go there so it ended up being a very good educational experience for me to learn about this it was like merchandising college that's right. how it right was. right right this swami was because my dad used to go when i was a kid in the 60s he was a carpenter and he would put the blanket out you know old school yeah. put the blanket out sell his old tools and yeah. make a little extra money, right? And I would be there with them. So the swap meet, that particular one, I grew up in that oh, swap yeah. meet. Yeah. But nobody knew that. <laughs> so I was like, what are you doing in that swap meet? Shit, I've been here since I was eight years old, right. you know, seven years old. I'm That's a veteran in this place. You used to get my hair cut here, man. <laughs> yeah, if they, well, if they could do that. Then That's yeah. how I used to be at the Poti Flea Market, man. You ever been to Poti Flea Market? I did that one for years, yeah. too. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, all tore up. The concrete's all tore up. Yeah, yeah. They got the boots already made. Oh, at the end of the day. Homemade boots in there. You just kind of make them. You have locals the size of marbles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dust, yeah. You know? Yeah, man. That's that's where... No, it was fun, though. I met a lot of great people, and uh, I learned a lot. I really just learned a lot. Now I have my shop. I have all this. I have way more than this, but, um, you know, I, I just 
developed so much of it that I needed to have a place. Right. And also, I'm getting older and schlepping your ass around the country with all your stuff. Right. Airports and bus terminals and <laughs> train stations. Oh my God, it gets so much work. Yeah. Right, it's right. so much work. And it was just me, you know? I didn't have no assistant or nobody helping well, me, so... Yeah. It's a lot easier now that they could just come to me, you know? I'm right there in San Antonio at the Trader's Village. There you go. It's a beautiful place. Yes, sir, it and is. And I have a nice, you know, I make it nice. You got a certain boot number? Yeah, I'm at 334. You hear that? 334, 334. Trader's Village, San Antonio, Texas. If you need any merchandise, memorabilia, you know, anything having to do with Mr. Danny De La Paz, you pull up yeah. and see him every Saturday. And you know, when I was doing this back in the 90s, there wasn't any actors out there. Right. Not, not Latino. Yeah. None. None. And um, I think, you know, I kind of feel like me and Daza were kind of like um, pioneers in a way. She for the girls yeah. and me for the males. And... You know, that were involved in the entertainment industry or whatever, you know, because, man, I give it up to Dazza. She she made a whole business out of that thing when nobody was doing that. Yeah. And she and her mom. She and her mom, man. And um, now you see actors all... I think a lot of the actors saw, you know, that there was nothing undignified about it, you know, and they just started doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, man. You're getting older. People love them, and the movies... Have not died out. I actually thought when I was back at the swamp meet in the 90s, I, used, I remember I used to tell myself, you know what, you probably got mm, 2002, 2003, maybe, and then this is all going to end because everyone's going to forget about those movies. Right. But I didn't count on the internet and personal computers. And I didn't count on all that. Yeah. And no, then plus, way. they started releasing it on physical media, you know, DVDs and Blu rays. Right. And that was another thing. And now, like, um, American Me's been on Netflix for the past seven mm -hmm. months. So it's been introduced to a whole new generation of people that never even heard of it. Right. You know, 16, 17 year olds, like, what's this? You know, because it's on Netflix, they're all over it, you know, and they like it. And they don't really make films that particular style anymore. Right. It's changed a lot the way that films look now, mm -hmm. the way they're made now. But yeah, so that's pretty much what uh, what made me go into all this. But I love it. I really do enjoy it. I wouldn't do it if I didn't like it. It isn't about the money. Yeah. It really isn't. That's and and I really enjoy the, the fans. They, they show you so much love. It, it's just really unbelievable. I can't even describe the things yeah. they write. Right. You know, on social media. These big, long letters. Yeah, that was ever very, very strong Personal following. histories. And strong. I remember one girl told me that she had been in an accident. And she was in a coma for, I think it was a week or a week and a half or something. And she came out of the coma. But the only thing she remembered was that Chuko came up and kissed her on her forehead. That's nice. <laughs> and I was like, wow, you thought Chuko from the big BGB when you were in a coma? Right? <laughs> wow. I, mean, I just started crying, you know, I just sat there reading it like I could not believe it. She just felt compelled to tell me right. the memory she had. That's the only thing she remembers. And that's one thing I want to point out about you because I know I showed you an old picture of us from back in the days. Mm. <laughs> with People show me those go. all the time. Yeah. And I always think, oh, where did that shirt go? Yeah. <laughs> I see all these clothes I used to have. I'm like, where, where did that jacket go? Yeah. So I slept at the dry cleaners or something. One thing about you that I've always respected and loved is because I'm the same way. Like when it comes to fans and when it comes, it's people. Like I'm a people person, and it's it's very important. Humility is everything. And yes. there's I know that I've never because you know you kind of hear about everybody, and I've never heard anybody say, oh well, you know he he's very you know like rude to his fans or whatnot. You know. What I'm oh, saying? I'm sure I I have been from time to time, but yeah. no, on the. You know, for the most part, you know, when I got older and stuff, I, I really began to really appreciate that kind of love because, you know, people don't have to say nice things to you. And right. You know how this world is today. Yeah. And, um, yeah, they go out of their way to be really, really kind. And it's just very, it's very beautiful. It really is. And I just want to have, you know, gratitude for it because... I, I didn't know that, that you could reach people right. like that. I, never, yeah. I didn't know that was on the menu. You know, I didn't have any clue that four decades later we'd still be talking about these movies. Right. Mm -hmm. If you had asked me that 40 years ago, I would have said, you're out of your mind. Those movies would be long forgotten by then. But I just didn't know. 
Nice, nice. Now, we're going to wrap things up, man. We're going to keep it moving because we're at the Southside Spots, the Big Creek Birthday Bash, CD release party. We got a whole concert going on, man. I just want to say thank you for stopping by, man, and you. showing us love, man. Out. You know, we got the first episode going, the Southside Talk, the first official Southside Talk episode with your boy, Big Creek. Pop that cherry. Pop that <laughs> Static TV behind the lens, you hey. already know. And one more time, man, I got to shout out our sponsors, man. The Beautiful Monsters, you need beats. Still banging music, Midget Local, what up? Hey. Southern Image, Custom Apparel, Paranoid Records, you need studio time. Dirty Money Records, man. The Big Homies Network, get you right. The AC Doctors, man, get you right. Stay high, wake and bake. Yes, sir. Texas Pop Nation. The Mr. Pop Podcast, man. Subscribe. DJ Lucky, the UPS Pop man, Pop man. Pop man. Pop yes, sir. Bear County Cuts on the haircuts. Dirty Berry Soda on the motherfucking drink. And Culture Collective and Alex Airbrush on the art. This Thank is you. the Southside Talk with motherfucking Lokita and our Thank first you. guest. Mr. Yeah, Danny De La Paz, you know what I'm saying? We out, man. Until next time.